Welcome to the Biblical Eldership Podcast. We are in chapter 25 today. If sick, call the elders of the church. This is a this is a great chapter. I love this chapter. And of course, this comes from James uh, chapter 5, 13, 14, and 15. Let me read this. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Uh, Alex, this chapter is is unique or just this section in James is unique because it, it brings in some early elders uh, and uh, it's a, it just has a different spin a different feel than than the pastorals uh talk to us just about the contribution of james uh to the topic of eldership well david you're absolutely right uh this is james the lord's um, half brother and he's writing to jewish christian churches probably scattered as a result of persecution so it may very well be the earliest record of the elders of the church. Now, he's writing to Jews, so this would be very well understood by them, uh, the council of elders. But note that the person who's sick is to call the elders of the church, not the past, mm -hmm. pastor or the priest or the healer or the deacons. They call the elders plural of the church. But what's really interesting about the whole book is that James's letter begins and ends with prayer. Mm. And so this points to the fact that the elders need to be men of prayer. You've got this great quote by uh, Tasker who uh, uh, captures James thinking. He says, the habit of prayer should be and indeed is one of the most obvious features which differentiates a Christian from other people. Well, James goes on to say in chapter 5, verse 16, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So he says, if you're suffering, pray. If you're happy, praise. If you're sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. So the elders need to be men of prayer. And when we face sickness and we're in a world full of sickness and disease and death, the care of the sick is a, a really a major part of the local church mm. and its elders. We need to care for those who are sick among us. Yeah, this highlights really a key aspect of uh, just the office of an elder, what they're to do. It's not, this is not the board elder. This is, this is a caring, loving shepherd, uh, shepherds who are uh, caring for the people. Now, one of the, one of the debates that uh, comes up here is, is this, and you highlight this, is this physical sickness or is this spiritual sickness or spiritual uh, weakness? Uh, how do you, I mean, talk to us about that. Well, yes, this is a controversy. Um, does this word atheneo mean weak those who are uh, defeated spiritually in the battle uh, they've lost their ability to endure their suffering uh, they've fallen spiritual warriors they're exhausted weary depressed defeated so a number of commentaries not very many take this to be dealing with spiritual lethargy or depression However, I do not think that is the right interpretation of this Greek word. This Greek word in the Gospels and Acts always means physical sickness. It's the common word for sickness. Now, yes, there are occasions in which it is used of one who is weak, spiritually weak in the faith. It is used that, that way. But this context seems to me uh, to not lean that way. And so there is an ambiguity in the word, but that is true also of the other words. There's an ambiguity in all the words here if you don't get the context straight. The word save, the term will raise him up, hmm. heal in verse 16. Do all these terms refer to a right. spiritually depressed person? Right. Well, let's just look at the context here real quickly. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but it's certainly... Um, something that we need to understand well. So if you look at the context, notice 
This person is calling the elders of the church to come. Does someone who is spiritually weak do that? Well, they, they possibly could. But notice right. this. The elders pray, and this is an unusual phrase, over him, which suggests a scene in which the person is bedridden or seated and several elders standing or kneeling over the person. And then he says the Lord will raise him up, I would say from a sick bed, Mm-hmm. and save him, the one who is sick. You highlight also the anointing with oil. The only other time that's used is uh, is dealing with someone who's physically sick. Uh, so just, yeah, context here would indicate someone who's physically ill. You also highlight that basically all the modern English translations uh, use this word uh, sick and not weak. In other words, they don't translate it as, as just someone who's weak, but physically sick so it seems like there's pretty much consensus is that true oh yes the commentators too most of your commentators all these english versions use the word sick which is the common word for sick and you are right david the mark 6 13 passage anointing with oil is totally in the context of healing sick people so i would say this The overall context over him, anointing with oil, calling for the elders, dealing with possibly uh, sin in the life of a person. All of these uh, uh, words and and phrases suggest a sick person in bed needing special attention from the elders. So, Alex, here's a question for you. Why doesn't this happen, or at least in my my? perspective this doesn't seem to happen a lot where someone calls the elders and they come and pray over him anointing him with oil why what do you think that is i think simply people haven't been taught it or they've never seen it done before or mistranslations of of this passage where people say well it's a temporary thing or some people just say oh it was a medical thing it's like you know uh, come and pray and give them aspirin for their sickness. So in some sense, people have just wiped out the meaning of this, but we practice it in our church. And I would tell you, it's a precious time when the elders meet with someone who's really sick and they're desperate. And we come, we sing together, we pray together, we share scripture together. It is very encouraging to a person uh, dealing with serious illness. I was just going to say, I I think honest, this is a sincere statement that in the 20 years or so I've, I've been an elder the most precious times of ministry have been these situations honestly uh the amount of tear i mean people are in crisis they're in they're they're on the sick bed they're you know sometimes they're able to come into an elders meeting and we'll pray for them uh, here at the church but it's it's tears it's communicating to them the lord we are ambassadors of the lord jesus christ he's the one that cares for you he loves you he's the one who's ordained this it's a very touching precious uh, experience to to be ministered to from the leaders of the church representing the lord jesus christ Uh, a lot of times we're kneeling down again we'll get the olive oil out Uh, but Th- that this these have been the most precious times pastorally for me personally well we have been studying this all through this series elders shepherd the church of god this is a part of the shepherding work so if you remember way back somewhere early in chapter th- two shepherding includes feeding the people food Secondly, protecting them from predators. Third, leading them to higher ground. But the fourth aspect of shepherding is the practical care. And this Mm -hmm. would be one of the examples of the practical marrying, burying, praying for Mm -hmm. the sick. You know, I want to give a charge to elders listening to this that, you know, to borrow from a John Piper phrase, don't waste your suffering or don't waste the suffering. There's opportunities. People people are in misery all around. Uh, the, as you've said, Alex, the fingerprints of the curse are on everything. Life is messed up. There's a lot of pain, a lot of sickness. Uh, elders, this is an opportunity to uh, really uh, showcase the Lord's tenderness and kindness. Uh, and so you hear about these opportunities. Don't outsource them. Don't ignore them. Uh, go and visit and uh, anoint with oil and pray over uh, the sick and the hurting. You know, uh, we could very easily say, 
why do the elders have to go and uh, be with? Because that's the point is, is the sick person's uh, obligation to initiate the call, which itself would be an act of faith. Why do they have to call the elders to pray over them? Couldn't the elders just pray from church? And wouldn't that be sufficient? Do they have to be with them? Would you comment on that and comment on some of the statements that were made about this? Yeah, I mean, I think the tendency might be to outsource this or let the deacons do it or let uh, others do it. But this this is an opportunity to uh, show the Lord's tenderness and kindness. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I just concur with what you said. You've got this quote here from, uh, again, Tasker, who says, while it's true that they, the elders, could intercede for the sick man without being present at his bedside. Nevertheless, by coming to the actual scene of suffering, by praying with insight and hearing of the sufferer himself, not only is their prayer likely to be more heartfelt and fervid, but, but the stricken man may well become more conscious of the effective power of prayer uttered in faith by which even in moments of the most acute physical sickness, communion with God can be maintained. This is something we can't Zoom, or if we can, it's not as effective. Mm. There's something about the embodied presence, the physical presence of someone else with you, praying for you, that it communicates something. Um, it's powerful. Well, look at the anointing with oil. You have to touch the person to it, rub with mm. oil or right. um, anoint um, and there's something about face-to-face -face you can see and feel. I remember once we went to pray for a lady who was very, very sick with a very rare disease. It eventually killed her. But I remember being there, and she started to vomit, and whatever was in her stomach was all green, vile, and she vomited all over me. Well, you know what? <laughs> this accentuate your prayers it ratchets your <laughs> prayers up lord help this lady so yes right. you can pray in your closet but when you're there and the yeah. person is sick and you touch them and they touch you and you share your love it's different why don't you read that uh, quote by mitten yeah i think that's a powerful I, quote too. i will but before i just uh, just a comment something you've said that has stuck with with me um over the years is these old, older ladies uh they don't get touched all week you know, they, they may go a couple of weeks. No one touches them. You know, Sunday morning is an opportunity. You wrap your arm around them. You give them a hug, give them a kiss on the side of the cheek, uh, hold their hand, rub their hand. Uh, they love that. I mean, most do. Oh, yes. But they, uh, th no, really, they they all love that. They This is something where they look forward to it. They come in through the front door. We're greeting them, hugging them. Uh, or affectionate, physically affectionate, and uh, that there's an appropriate tenderness and sweetness that, that I think is communicated. Yes, on a Sunday morning, I look for any of the older widows and I make sure I give them a big hug. And yes, they really love that. I call it circulating and percolating. You're moving around the church. You're not just standing and talking to your best friends or eating all the donuts you can eat. You're out there among the sheep and ministering to them. And some of them need a hug, a, a holy kiss in the Lord, and to be given attention, particularly by the elders of the church. Someone just recently told me about a, a church where uh, the elders, they've got elders, they love biblical eldership, but the elders all just kind of hide. They're never at the front door. They're never, no, no one knows who they are. And again, it, it comes back to this pastor's presence and you know, I think it ties in to physically visiting the uh, sick and uh, uh, praying over them. And there's something about this whole that ties together, just the pastor's presence, the affection, physically touching. Um, anyway, you've well, got a great uh, quote. Uh, David, yeah. if you remember very early in the book, we talked about the job of the shepherd. And one of the jobs as a shepherd is to be present and to be seen. And so we uh, remarked on Philip Keller's great book, mm -hmm. uh, Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, where he goes over and over 
about the importance of the shepherd's presence and how the sheep respond to his presence. The same thing is true in the church. There's nothing worse than invisible elders. Uh, maybe they think, oh, the pastor does that. Uh, the professional does that. Uh, we don't do that. We sit with our family. We walk in, we walk out. No, 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 no. That's not biblical eldership. It's not a biblical elder. We're shepherds. We must be with the people. We must be seen by the people. And this is a beautiful example of the personalized ministry yeah. of the elders all right finally this quote by leslie mitten uh and this is so good could not prayer have been offered just as effectively in the church gathering did they need to be physically present with the sick man if our religion were a matter of theory these questions would be justified but we're dealing with men and women in need of help our Lord himself did not decline to go to people in need. When invited, though, he could heal from a distance with the word when it was appropriate to do so. In fact, prayer offered in our presence and for our precise needs by Christian friends has a powerful and efficacy that may be lacking in prayers offered in our absence. We are creatures of flesh and blood as well as spirit. And when love for us is proved by the readiness of Christian friends to give their time to come to our home in our need, we are more immediately aware of that love. Its effectiveness in prayer is increased by the fact that we have been made aware of it. Mm, amen. That's a wonderful <laughs> That's quotation. A good quote, yeah. No, you know, I think of just the post COVID era of we kind of distance. We tend to, we want to, we want to Zoom. We want to FaceTime. Uh, it's easier. And I'm, there's obviously a place for that. It's a blessing in many ways. But uh, I, I think there's a, we need to move back to the embodied presence of physical touch, ministering. Uh, this is a great antidote uh, in our day and age. Now, let's talk about anointing with oil. Uh, what in the world does this mean? I know you later on in the chapter get into, is this, you know, is there medicinal? I know some people hold that view. There's medicinal aspects to the oil or is it symbolic? Talk, talk to us about the oil. Well, uh, this anointing with oil or rubbing with oil, um, it goes way back into the Genesis when Jacob uh, rubbed oil or anointed a uh, stone to remind him of God's dealings with him and God speaking to him. So basically, whether it's a priest or a king or some object, the anointing with oil sets something apart for special divine use. And so I think what it means here is that it's um, an aid to prayer. And because the person is sick, the rubbing with oil maybe on the forehead or uh, on the face, um, sets the person apart for specialized prayer by the elders of the church. And can you imagine how encouraging and uh, relevant this is to a very sick person who might be full of fear and isolation and pain? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this oil, probably just olive oil, it's not some special uh, magic magical potion uh let, let, let's get real practical let's say you're visiting someone you bring a little vial of oil what do you do what do you say to them you know i mean this is a, for a lot of people this is a foreign thing this is a little bit strange a little odd what are we doing i've got you know five men surrounding me and there's oil and they're going to pray. I mean, this can be kind of a strange, foreign thing. W what do you say to them? Just pretend for a minute you're visiting someone. How do you explain I have this? never found one person who finds it strange. They find it precious and they, are, they welcome this. There's something really special and that's what the oil does. You are specially marked out for our prayers. So in a sense, you're there. You've got four or five elders with you. You lay hands on the person. Someone rubs it on the forehead or the cheek or on the hand, wherever you think it's appropriate for the person. And then you all pray. We like to kneel. Uh, we like to sing some songs. I think it's important to sing some good songs when you're with a person. It is so edifying to the sick mm -hmm, person. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if it's not something they've seen before, when it happens, they go, yeah. this is special. And it's done. I mean, you highlight this. It's done in the name of the Lord. We That's are here right. on behalf of the Lord. He's the one who cares for you. We are his ambassadors. And uh, it's done 
in the name of the Lord. I want to pick up on what you said. In the Old Testament, they had a sacred oil, which could not be used for any common or per se reason. And um, that oil was used for the tabernacle. It was used for the priest. It was called the holy oil. This is not that. Yeah. That oil could only be used by uh, the priest and only for certain occasions. This is a common olive oil, common oil. There's nothing that needs the priest or the elders to make holy. So I want to make that very so clear. So that highlights a, another argument here that some people would say, I could think of a number of commentators I've read who hold this view, who say this this oil was actually medicinal. This is... Uh, this was meant to help them medically. What, what? How would you respond to that? Well, I would say this. The medicine has already been applied. It hasn't worked. That's why we're calling for the elders. Um, I don't believe James wants the elders to be doctors. And James certainly doesn't believe oil is the only remedy there is. In the ancient world, they had many remedies, many, not just a few. Oil was only one. Um, but you go back again to Mark 6, uh, 13, mm -hmm. where we have a, an actual example of the apostles healing the sick and using oil, possibly in that context, to really emphasize the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine if in Mark 6 it was medication? Well, that would ruin the whole purpose to show the Messiah is here. This is a, a, a divine healing. And then you mix it up with aspirin or some kind of medication. <laughs> no, no, that confuses everything. Yeah. The oil points to God, to the sacredness mm -hmm. and the, the miraculous purpose of God at work. Any other comments on that? Otherwise, I want to talk about this prayer of faith. Oh, yes. Let's go there. What is this prayer of faith? Is this a special kind of prayer? Is this uh, only elders can pray this? Uh, what does he mean by the prayer of faith? Well, remember what we said when we started. This book of James has a lot to say about prayer. Yeah, it starts right. with prayer. It ends right. with prayer. Mm -hmm. The prayer of faith is simply a person who is not vacillating, which you see in the first chapter, a Christian who vacillates right. from the world to the Christian world of the world, and uh, they're not stable. So this is a prayer given with a, a stability, a trust, a confidence that God is listening and God will respond to the prayer. Think of these quotes, you know, verses Matthew 21, 22. Whatever you ask in prayer, you will, re you will receive if you have faith. Or whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. Uh, obviously, some amazing promises, but but talk about. I mean, these are these sound like absolute statements. Um, talk to me about that. You have a comment in here. I'll just read what you said. You said such absolute expressions are part of a wide range of language. I thought this was helpful used by our Lord to vividly and dramatically teach those who by nature are dull to grasp spiritual truths and to be bold, confident, and persistent in prayer. I thought that, I thought that was really helpful. Well, uh, we have a number of these in the gospel. These are absolute unrestricted statements that teach mainly the power of faith and prayer. And the Lord uses this kind of language uh, throughout the gospels. Kind of motivate now, us, inspire us. Oh, de definitely. Well, James and Jesus rightly expect the listeners to understand that there are legitimate, unexpressed qualifications to such absolute statements. He says nothing of the possibility of failure from the human perspective. And every one of us are going to die someday. Right, and yeah. some of the greatest faith healers in the world, well known, have all died of cancer or some strange disease. So... Uh, this is not um, a statement that you will never die. Yeah. And then you highlight that prayer at Gethsemane of, you know, the Lord crying out in prayer, but saying, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Uh, there is this attitude along with the promises of God and the faith we have of just 
submitting, Lord, your will be done here. Well, uh, the Lord, uh, the uh, the Apostle Paul was one of the greatest men of prayer, and uh, he prayed three times. Right. It must have been a special kind of prayer. Uh, Lord, take away this uh, affliction, this this uh, thorn of Satan, which may be, we're guessing, but there is some evidence, something to do with his eyes. Right. And of course, for a man who travels, who loves to read, who loves to write, uh, that's a pretty uh, heavy burden. Well, then and the if, Lord said, I'll give you grace. I'm not going to yeah, take it away. Right, right. And I'm going to use your sickness to keep you in a humble state. Well, then you mentioned Epaphroditus. Uh, Paul could have, you know, here, here he's suffering with sickness. He could have, uh, he's, he's ill near to death, but Paul uh, evidently doesn't just go and heal him. I mean, he's, he remains sick. There's no indiscriminate healing in the New Testament. Yeah. yeah. Even the apostle could not indiscriminately heal. They had to pray. They had to ask the Lord's yeah. will. Good and reminder. remember, God uses our affirmities and our sicknesses to get our attention and to guide us. And in Paul's case, to keep him in a state of dependence and humility after all the great special mm -hmm. revelations he had. And this is a very successful man, brilliant man. It could very easily go to his head like it does to most of us. But God kept him in a state of dependence on God in prayer. Now, James ends this with a little clause, a little statement, and says, if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, how do you handle this? Um, I imagine a lot of times when you're visiting someone, you're going to want to read the, actually read the passage in James. And then he quickly transitions into you know, if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. How do you handle that in a pastoral situation? You know, I mean, you know, I know the Bible teaches very clearly not all sin uh, or not all sickness is because of sin, but some might be. I mean, we see examples of that. So how do you pastorally maneuver that in a, you know, someone who's sick on their bed in the hospital? Do you get into this question of sins, how do you, how do you approach well, it, that? It is an if clause, if. We don't know. Yes, this is a time of pastoral counseling. If there is sin, and by the way, I went through this myself. In the early 90s, I lost my voice completely. It took years, uh, three, four, or five years to be able to use it in any normal sense. And so... When I asked for prayer, the elders came to my house. Uh, I told them, I'm searching my heart. If there is some sin, some um, hidden sin, uh, I want to confess it. Mm -hmm. And I confessed certain things that I thought, maybe this is at the bottom of it. So the elders should be prepared to give comfort and to give counsel and to help a person confess and to help for restoration. We know that from 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul says some of you are sick mm -hmm. and ill, and some of you have died right, because right. of your sin. Right. So yes, we need to be prepared to deal with the sin question. Uh, remember Galatians 6, 1, we do it with graciousness and gentleness right. because we could fall into the same sin. Yeah, I guess it's a good reminder to this should at least be on on the elders' minds of this. This could be a counseling situation of of soul care and uh, at least broaching that. And you know, of course, reading the James passage, uh, you've got a quote here by Thomas Manton, who reminds us that Christ worshippers are not exempted from sickness, no more than any other affliction. Those that are dear to God have their share of miseries. Well, we're in a world that's broken, sinful, cursed. And so, yes, we get sick, we die, we have brokenness, and uh, but we have forgiveness and we have the blood of Christ. And if we just keep close accounts with the Lord, uh, that is the best thing to do. I want to hear your thoughts as we bring this chapter to a close. But I know for me, Again, it comes back to don't waste these opportunities to uh, minister. There's a lot, there's plenty of brokenness. There's a lot of sickness, a lot of pain, a lot of tears. Elders, th these are opportunities for us to uh, embody um, the Lord's kindness and mercy and tenderness to a hurting world. Uh, this this is not ancillary. This is not this is not an option. This is our responsibility. And uh, this James passage really punctuates that. Yes. And 
I think this goes along with Acts 20, when Paul talks to the Ephesian elders, remember the weak. Mm -hmm. The weak, they're not spiritual weak. They're weak physically, financially. They're in trouble, and the elders are to help them and to give to them. It's very similar to James. Both of these passages emphasize the caring, healing ministry of the elders, not just teaching, not just protecting, but this very practical part of loving care for our people. Or we should say, these are examples of shepherding the Lord's people. So actually, there are there are some difficult uh, interpretive problems here, but don't let them override the clear message, call the elders of the church, have them pray. No one disagrees with that. Mm -hmm. And if you want to use the oil to enhance your prayers and to encourage the person, fine. If you don't want to do that, it's mysterious to you, pray. That's the main thing. And be people of confident prayer. Pray with boldness. Don't pray with the skittishness. Ask the Lord, bring healing, Lord. We know you can do this. Your will be done. And this will help people enormously. Amen. Help the elders too, by the way. Alex, thanks. This is a great chapter. Biblical Eldership Resources is committed to equipping church elders to help them be effective, godly leaders of the church. Please consider donating to the ministry so that we can continue to provide essential eldership resources for church elders around the world. To donate, go to biblicaleldership.com.